I want to drive home the value of IoT one more time, and I'm going to do it by comparison two projects of ours. Okay, so this is going to be IoT in Industry 4.0 versus an Industry 3.0, Industry 4.0 hybrid. Take zero. All right, so we have two projects here. We're going to call this one Project A, okay, and we're going to call this one Project B. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the architectures of these two projects out on the board, right? So this customer, Project A customer, has 550 EFMs out on the, the field, okay? Those 550 EFMs all talk over, they all talk over uh, either free wave radio or cellular connections, cellular gateways. Okay. So we have low bandwidth network. Project B has 250 rigs operating out in the field. These are Siemens S7, and these are ABB total flows, nearly all of them. There's some various versions, G3, G4. These are Siemens Step 7. And these are also all talking over free wave, some satellite, and cellular, okay? Both of these customers came to us and asked for an enterprise class SCADA system. Step one is connectivity. Step two is the enterprise class SCADA system. So they want all the full capabilities, alarming, notification, remote control, remote monitoring, and optimization, okay? What these guys do is they're water wastewater, but they're mobile water wastewater. What these guys do is oil and gas production, okay? These guys have way more money than these guys do. That, that's my whole point, is this is a low, much lower margin business, but they have the same needs. Same, same needs. All right, we developed both of these projects. One is architected ideally, okay? So this project, this project right here, we did an ideal solution. So we started with the customer doing a proof of concept. We tested lots of different IIoT architectures, different hardware. We originally tested Raspberry Pis on the edge, and then we moved up to uh, like an inexpensive consumer PC that was like uh, 180 bucks, and then we went up to the Avantech Uno and made the decision we needed to use the Uno. So we, we were very deliberate in designing this solution. This solution was on a very, very tight schedule, this right here. This is the non-ideal solution. That the advantage of this solution is that the client came to us because we're known for IIoT solutions, and so they wanted us to build the immediate solution, and then we're going to go back in and build it ideal, okay? Because these guys are obviously in a better market, higher margins. They can afford to do things twice. These guys can only afford to do things once. All right, so let's, let's look at the two architectures. There's 250 rigs out here. Each rig has two PLCs on it, okay? So our architecture, the way that we did this, the way that we built the architecture, we installed, we installed Ignition Edge. So we've got uh, an Edge PC. We have Ignition, actually we're not running Ignition Edge. We're running regular Ignition plus the Siemens driver, the Siemens uh, OPC driver, and we're running our MQTT transmitter, okay? So we're running an edge PC on every rig with Ignition and Siemens, uh, Siemens driver. Ignition does nothing but just talk to the, the PLC. There's no visualization running on this Ignition. And we have an MQTT transmitter that we wrote. We didn't buy one because our goal here was this had to be $800 or less per rig. So when we designed it, we designed it this way so that we could get to the $800 mark. We had to write our own MQTT transmitter because we couldn't purchase one and keep the cost at $800 or less. This is, this is a new, newer company. All right, so the way that this works is they publish up into the cloud. So this is a cloud-based ignition solution. It's ignition SCADA, okay? So this is all over MQTT. So it is report by exception. It is edge driven and it's lightweight. That's open. And it's open, obviously, as well, the MQTT part. We are doing MQTT Spark Plug B. Um, Spark Plug B. So we, are, we wrote our MQTT transmitter to be able to grab the tags from Ignition and publish over MQTT Spark Plug B. We do not publish to an Ignition broker. We are using an open broker 
that Ignition subscribes to. And we're using MQTT Engine for all of our tags. Okay. Each rig has about 800 tags, so each rig pair has about 1,600 tags total. So the total number of tags, so there are 400,000 tags in the total solution. 400K tags, okay? Right now, we have full process control. We have no outbound ports open, so there's no inbound ports open. It's completely closed off inbound, but we still have process control because of this stateful connection on the outbound port, okay? So we create an encrypted connection to the broker, and then we can actually change set points and monitor everything. We are running Ignition. We're also running Canary Historian up here. We have 400,000 tags. Uh, the average uh, bandwidth is 256K per second bandwidth. Okay, so basically nothing. We get all 400,000 tags every one second at a up to one second, okay? We have MQTT set up so that it never publishes a payload more frequently than every one second from one of the edge nodes, okay? So we have one second visibility on 400,000 tags in this solution. Full closed loop control. All right, let's switch over here. So over here, we're over free wave and cellular. And this is what we have now. Um, we are using nothing on the edge, okay? Okay, there's nothing on the edge. We don't have anything out on the edge at all. What we have is up here, we have, and then we have this. So we have, Cap one, cap two, we have ignition, we have cap zero, um, let me do this, we have our database, and over here we have our database. We have 150 EFMs configured there, got like 170 EFMs configured there, and we have like 170 EFMs configured here. So we have three separate pull response environments. You want to know why? Because we found out during the integration that Kepware's, so we're using the EFM suite, we have to have three instances of the EFM suite because we found out during this project that in the new newest release, you can't have more than 199 EFMs running in Kepware without Kepware failing. So we originally, that we purchased a 1,000 EFM license. We put about 500 EFMs in. Then we broke it out into two and we went 250, 250 and it still failed. We opened up a ticket with Kepware and they discovered, hey, it's, it's 199. So the recommendation is 199. So we have three connections. We have three OPC servers that are pulling and responding out to the field. Now, the way that the field is broken up is by tower. So we actually did, you know, tower one, and then they're all broken up by tower. So we're, we actually configured ours, and I think there are nine towers, maybe 10 towers, that we talked to. So we have poll response. Guess how frequently, now we're bringing back, here's what, here are the things that we're bringing back. We're bringing back EFM history. So for those of you that work with ABB total flows, you can set a configuration inside the total flow for storing production history by the hour, by the day, and then uh, any of the events and alarms, that kind of stuff. You can pull that using Kepware's driver. It's actually an outstanding driver. You can pull all that information which contains all of that contextual data on the edge. Well, the reason you have to pull EFM history by doing a request through the EFM exporter, which is what we're using inside of Kepware, is because the architecture never allows you to get updates every second because we're not using report by exception, we're not using an IoT infrastructure. In this industry 3.0, industry 4.0 hybrid that we have over here, we have to pull and wait for a response from 550 EFM. So we have to set up a polling engine that never pulls them all at the exact same time, that we never pull for EFM trend data. If for those of you that don't know, you can create trends inside of a total flow. PL trend, plunger lift, gas assist plunger lift, uh, gas lift plunger lift. Those are some of the default trends you can create in there. You can add in data points. And then basically you go and pull that once a day. And it brings back all the trend data. So we- It would be one stroke or? Uh, it's basically a plunger arrival. So the trend, the way that the trend is set up for this customer is they store the data every minute. So uh, it'll be tubing casing, valve position, a closed reason, opened reason, that kind of stuff. All right, so we get EFM history, we get EFM trend data, and then we get process data, okay? Now process data is what's the casing pressure right now? What's all that? All right, we get EFM history one time per day. We get trend data two times per day. 
and we get process data every six hours, okay? And the network is plugged, okay? So we can go, we can navigate to a screen and do a demand poll and bring that data back. But the most often that we're able to get all 550 meters updated over this slow ass connection, so again, they're over, okay, is we can get that history once a day. We can do a full round robin and get all 550 meters up once per day. Same thing with the EFM trend data, we can do that twice a day, basically every 12 hours. Now we can also get it on a demand poll, but that demand poll takes minutes once I fire a demand poll to get that trend data back, it'll take a couple of minutes for it to come back. And then we get the process data every six hours or on demand. So when they navigate to a specific well, they'll look and see when was that data last updated. It's running on a six hour scan class and then they'll hit a demand poll to get it updated. All right, so on the one side, we have the industry 3.0. This is not report by exception. This is poll response, okay? It is not edge driven, it's server driven and it's not lightweight, it's heavyweight. Why is it heavyweight? It's using OPC, okay? Why is it server driven? It's using OPC. And why is it pull response? Because it's using an OPC server. This is report by exception. This is edge driven and this is lightweight. I have 400,000 tags here at one second interval. So that is, I, I, when a value changes, it is updated in this server one second later, no matter what. Over here, guess how many tags we have? I actually just looked this morning. 500,000? 380K. 380K, we get one day, twice a day, every six hours. 400,000, we get it one second after it changes. Who do you think, who do you think gets more value from their system? Yeah, it's definitely project B. Now, this project we did in, let's say, eight weeks. This project we did nine months of trial to design the right architecture because most of the technology, we had to decide which technology was best. So once we take away that nine months, from beginning to end, it took about six months to do everything because we had to install an edge device out in the field. Now the way that that worked was we provision those edge devices here in our office. They all get shipped to the customer. The only thing that changes on that edge device is the host name. We change the host name, the name of the computer. Our transmitter will then pull the host name from the computer and add that into the MQTT topic namespace. So it's automatic. All we gotta do is change the host name. We provision it, image it, ship it, the customer installs it. The second they install it, that site shows up in the SCADA system. Over here, everything has to be done manually. Now, well, yeah, we have to manually add the tags inside of Ignition. So when you start calculating the value, granted, this did take longer for us to design and deploy. We wrote our own transmitter, which took basically three months to perfect because we wanted to perfect, we wanted to support store and forward, we wanted to support spark plug B, we'd never written the transmitter before. But at the end of the day, when we did that, it saved the customer you know, 60000 $100,000, something like that, in cost. This is a fully hosted solution. So that is the customer just pays us every month for it. They've paid some capital costs, like they paid for all the edge devices, but the rest of the solution they pay us every month. Over here is the server is hosted because they don't want to host it themselves, but they paid for the, all the development of the solution. So what is the industry 3.0 cost for project A versus when you redo it for industry 4.0, like an estimate of the, including the edge device? Sure. So this total project is going to end up being, I would have to look and see what the, this costs less to do. Okay, this costs less than this one did. This project costs, let's say, somewhere between a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars to develop. I don't know what the exact number is, but I don't think it's north of 200k. I'm pretty sure it's not actually. And this one I know is not even close to 200k. Not even close. Yeah, they're just subscription, and I think we amortized it over nine months, so we get our money back after nine months, maybe or maybe a year. We get it back after a year. How and, much are the edge devices going to cost for all those? So our goal right now is whenever we do an edge solution, this is the new bar. So if you want me to use your device as an edge device and the full edge solution is going to cost more than $800, we're not going to use it. Our goal is 800 bucks installed the whole the whole deal. I mean, and that's what this is. This is 800 bucks. Will the customer typically install the devices then? Yeah. We've set it up so all that we send them with instructions. They do the installation. They plug in the cables. We're all done. So anyway, that is that is a a comparison. You know what I mean? The an important the important distinction here is that versus that. 
This is more tags. We could do the math. Now, could we get EFM history twice a day? Yes, we could, but it would screw up the demand polls. So when you demand poll while we're trying to pull all this EFM history, what ends up happening is it takes the demand poll a lot longer to respond. We bring the trend data back twice a day because they, they absolutely need it twice a day. But could we get it four times a day? Sure, we'd probably get it four times a day. But it's going to slow down how long it takes for the demand poll to respond to. Because again, when we fire the demand poll, when we fire the demand poll, we're respecting the client scan rate. When we fire the demand poll, everything that lives in the namespace we go get. With report by exception, the edge is publishing to us only the stuff that changed when it changed. Why it is anyone is wasting their friggin' money on solutions like this. Now, I understand why this customer did it. They had no choice. We could not install edge devices as fast as we needed to so they could hit this six to eight week target. So we had no choice but to do this. But the customer did this. This customer did it knowing that I just had to get this in and then we'll go ahead and wipe all this out. We'll wipe all this part out. We'll still keep that there. We'll go ahead and put edge in here and then start doing this. Like they know that that's what they're going to do long term. They entered that project knowing that. A million dollars to do 800, 500 edge devices. Say that again. 500 edge devices at 800 a piece would be like half a million. Yeah, it's going to be 400,000, half million dollars to get the edge devices out on 500. And now what they can probably do is group the edge devices. So they might be able to group the edge devices into say, like if there are three wells real close to each other, you can use one edge device. But again, that requires planning and time. We go ahead and look at the GPS coordinates of everything. We say, how reasonable is it? Do we got to put in any additional radios? All that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, if this field that they had, this, this field that's producing oil and gas, they have real time visibility to. Imagine how much more they could produce because they'd be optimizing the wells in real time. They don't optimize their wells in real time right now. They optimize it a day at a time, right? What they do is at the beginning of the day, they look at all the EFM history and the trend data and the operators then make adjustments to the well, the well optimization, they make adjustments to the well based on what happened yesterday. And the only reason they're doing it based on what happened yesterday is because they don't have real time visibility to everything that's happening today because of the limitations of the architecture. So how do they solve it? Okay, well, let's go ahead and put in, let's upgrade all of our free wave radios. Let's go ahead and where we have cellular, get rid of that, put free wave in. Let's go, let's move to a higher band. Let's put, go with 5G. Like they have to, they would either have to make huge amounts of investment in the infrastructure to bring back a bunch of data that they don't need. Do we need to bring back all the EFM history all the time? No, the only reason we're going to get it every single day is because if we wait three days, instead of it taking two minutes for the EFM history to come back per EFM, it's gonna take six minutes or eight minutes and it's gonna clog up the network just by virtue of the sheer volume of data that you're pulling and requesting and responding. This is a much more efficient architecture and it is far superior. When we show people this, 400,000 tags, one second, and they're looking at the SCADA system for this solution. When they look at this solution, they never believe that it's over free wave satellite and cellular, never. They're watching, you're looking at this whole wastewater screen and everything is updating in real time and the Canary Labs trend is all one second data all the time. And they can never wrap their brain around why that's the case. Most of your projects will have, say 60% of the tags running on the edge will be Booleans, right? So I'll poll, 60% of those Booleans that never change, yet every single one of those responses come over the wire. That doesn't happen over here. If the Boolean didn't change, it never ends up on the wire. It's just a much more efficient architecture. So anyway, I went into the weeds there, um, got way into detail. I'd love to hear your comments, questions, and concerns over this architecture. We will be migrating this architecture to this. That here starts, you know, here in the next couple of weeks, it looks like. So, and Zach wants me to tell you, like, subscribe, share, and watch the two videos we did on is OPC UA the future of IIoT? Uh, video one and then video two, which explains is a response to why PubSub is not the, the future for OPC UA. Anyway, um, I'm out.